good evening and welcome to the first of what we hope will be a long series of interviews with people who have made significant contributions to the Bardi Symphony and Wind Orchestras. My name's John Florence and I've had the pleasure of supporting the Bardi Orchestras uh, since, well, their early days. And this evening I had the opportunity to talk with our guest, Klaus Effland, conductor and musical director of the Vardy Symphony Orchestra. I hope that this will give us an insight into his background uh, in the musical world, his, his current activities and future plans, and it'll be interspersed with some of his music that he's chosen that he feels has influenced and inspired him. Please let me welcome Klaus Effland, conductor of the Vardy Symphony Orchestra, and our guest this evening. Klaus, hello, and a very warm welcome to the programme. Thank you. Good to see you, John. Um, let me ask you, before we get any further, about, if, if I may, your, your background. Do you come from a musical family? No. Musically, I'm really the black sheep in, um, in my family because um, my dad was uh, the head of the local fire brigade and my mum was a nurse, so, um, so they didn't play an instrument at all. Um, however, they loved listening to classical music, so um, I guess that's, that's, that's where it has started from. Can you remember some of the music that you heard as a, as a young child in the house then? Well, my birthday is actually on the 1st of January, and my parents would always watch the New Year's Day concert from uh, Vienna. And uh, yeah, automatically, I would, of course, uh, watch that as well. Um, and I think that's where the, the classical music interests, in my case, did start with the music uh, by Johann Strauss. I really love this music. And uh, it has played a central role in my life since, um, yeah, since uh, very early days. And um, because that I really loved this music uh, and, and somehow, you know, started to show an interest in, in, in the music by Strauss, my parents would actually uh, support it by buying um, a record with the music by the Strauss family. Well, that leads us very nicely into the first piece of music that you have chosen, and we'll talk a bit more about it afterwards. Uh, the first piece of music is the Blue Danube, uh, conducted, well, it's really got to be by the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. So let's just hear part of that now. Yeah. Well, that was part of the Blue Danube, played by the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by Paul Berm. And um, Klaus, one of the interesting things about the Strauss family is that their music uh, was much admired by classical music composers. Brahms loved Strauss waltzes. Tchaikovsky clearly did. Um, it, 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 there's something about that music that appeals to people will with every taste in classical music, I think. Well, I think with this music, you are just in such good company. Um, and the times we are having at the moment, I think you definitely need to be in very good company. So I think, <laughs> um, I th I think this music is really, is really the, it's, it's, it's absolutely, um, you know, it's it, Strauss was 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 really a, a a a person who could give so much joy by his music, and I think really this is what what um, well you know it was a pop, it was a pop music at that time, um, but I think you know it's it especially for these times you know the the joy and and, and the positive the happiness with a touch of melancholy. I think that is exactly the, the right ingredients, what we- Absolutely would, uh, right. I couldn't agree with you more. It's that quality of joy. But having said that, I have heard conductors on a number of occasions saying, actually, to really make that music sing and tell is actually quite difficult. Have you found that? Oh yeah. I mean, it's it's um, conducting conducting the bat, the the Fledermaus uh, operetta by, by Strauss is 
the most difficult you can conduct uh, in, in the in the repertoire of opera because it's it has to be as slight as Mozart and it's Mozart with a lot of rubati. It's it's really really difficult to to bring off as it is also with all the waltzes because you know it's if you if you play it if 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 you play it rather straightforward it it just sounds it it, it loses its its grace somehow. And the recording, what we've just listened to um, with, with the Carl Berman, the Vienna Philharmonic, was actually the first recording I, 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 my parents they gave me. And I've been about three, four years old. And I really did identify myself with this music in a rather bizarre way because um, uh, one of the pieces which is included on, 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 on the recording is the Emperor Waltz. And I loved that piece. And yes. as a boy, as a as a, as a as a boy, I had an invisible friend, and that was the <laughs> Emperor Walsh man, and he was with me all the time. And um, so you know, it, it it it, you know, I've I've I listened to this music, and as in particular to this recording, you know, on and on again. And actually, I have got the we just saw the uh, we just saw a, a, a cover of the recording that wasn't the original cover and i have actually found the the um, the original tape here i'll try to see if 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 you can uh, somehow oh, yeah. can see there's a photo here yes with strauss yeah. conducting and i love that i love that i love that painting i love that photo and i sort of you know saw myself i know it sounds a little bit odd but i actually saw myself uh, a little like the Strauss, I, I was a bit envy, you know, and I think, you know, you can see in the photo, there's something special about yeah. not just the role of a composer, but also the role of a conductor. Well, let me ask you about that, because presumably, well, let me ask you, when did you first feel that you wanted to devote your life to music? But I think actually it was for, from from that moment because uh, because there was there has never been an alternative. There has never been um, the question, you know, um, what 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 could it else be? It, it it just developed very automatically. I think my parents were at the beginning were a little bit concerned because they you know because it was such a burning desire yeah. or burning interest in that music because I listened to it every day. And I think they thought, ah, when he gets a bit older, the boy, it's, it's, it's going to vanish. But um, exactly the opposite happened. It, it, it got more and more intense. When did so, you know you wanted to be a conductor then? Well, it's a very good question, actually, because it raises also the question of whether, whether conductors, they are born or made. Um, I, I, I I always, you know, I, I never wanted to be anything else, and I, it it was it was just I had to be a conductor. I mean, it, it was uh, I, I later on started to to play an instrument, yes, but um, but I I was absolutely fond of 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 watching conductors, uh, you know, also you know, not just from the New Year's Day concert. But also when 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 classical uh, concert was uh, were were what uh, uh, shown um, uh, in television, yeah. so um, no, it was and again I think it 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 linked it all goes back to the photo where I just uh, did show <laughs> with Strauss being sort of the center of um, it's it's maybe a little bit you know romanticized, but I mean it's 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 it, you know it's it's. It, it, I was really drawn to that picture, you know, that you know, to that painting that you know that you well, are in the center. We'll talk but, a little bit more about that in a moment, but I think we'll have another piece of music now. Yes. Would you like to introduce this for us, please? Uh, the next one is the Beethoven. That's the Beethoven. Yeah, you know, I spent most of my childhood listening to music by Johann Strauss, and I think. Four or five years later, after I got the recording with 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 the Carl Berman Vienna Philharmonic, I think I think my parents thought they wanted to hear something different. I think it was about time that I should extend my knowledge a little bit. So I remember I was going on Easter holiday to my grandparents, and I must have been about you know seven eight years old. And as an Easter present, 
um, they gave me two recordings. One re recording was with music by Mozart, including you know, uh, uh, Eine kleine Nachtmusik and uh, one of the symphonies with some German orchestras. And the second recording was the Fifth Symphony by Beethoven with Karian and the Berlin Phil. And I remember the moment I did put that record on, it just took me aback. It was, you know, the opening is with Karian, it's, it's an explosion. And if you are into classical music and, and, and as a little boy, it just cannot leave you without a um, huge impression. Okay, well, uh, let's hear what you describe as the explosion at the beginning yeah. of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. One of the best known pieces of music ever, I suppose. That was the opening of uh, Beethoven's Symphony No. 5, the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by Herbert von Karajan. And I think he made about a recording, was it three cycles of Beethoven's Symphony, three or four? And this was the one that he made in 1963. Um, and I should say, actually, I should have said this before, that we are talking to you in Berlin about. Um, but it begs the question, when you're preparing a piece of music to conduct it, do you listen to recordings or does that cramp your style? What do you do? Well, I do listen to recordings, but but there comes a moment where, where you put the recording away. Uh, so you actually focus on reading, uh, reading, reading the score, because that's where that's of course where 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 the interpretation starts. Uh, that's where you start to make you know your your own decisions, mm -hmm. because if you're just listening to a recording, you will end up copying uh, a recording. So on one side, you know when you when when when, when like the Beethoven uh, uh, like the Beethoven Symphony, when you know when you know a piece so well by ear because you have listened to it uh, so many times. It's, it gives you, of course, a, a knowledge that you know how the piece goes, but it can also be very difficult because, uh, because you know, when you are reading the score, do you actually listen to the recording in your head or do you actually read uh, the texture? And that, that, can be, that can be quite tricky sometimes. And that's, some, that, that's, that's always going to be the debate about, you know, recordings with conductors, whether it's good or bad to listen to. But I think, you know, to extend the knowledge and, 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 and to keep uh, yourself up to date musically. I think recordings are very important. Now, I sort of have a, an image in my mind of you as a young child with a knitting needle conducting the speakers of the gramophone uh, as the Berlin Philharmonic and, and the Vienna Philharmonic play and everything. But what was, when was the first time that you actually, in earnest, took up a baton and conducted a live orchestra? Well, I was very fond of um, teddy bears as a <laughs> as a boy. So I col collected I collected all the teddy bears. I must have been about you know between twenty or thirty uh, teddy bears. Um, collect them together, and then you know I just put on the uh, blue Danube walls with the Vienna Philharmonic, and uh, would then <laughs> conduct uh, the teddy bear orchestra. And I have to say, you know, it's the best orchestra I've ever conducted. You know, they never. They never complained, and they always sounded like the Vienna Phil. And I remember when we, uh, when, 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 when we, when John, when we talked the other day, you, you said, "Well, probably at this very moment, it would be very good, you know, to take that up again, you know, to collect your tidbit <laughs> orchestra and conduct them again, because at the moment, as a conductor, you don't have an orchestra." <laughs> but when was the first time you conducted a, a, a real, you know, ensemble of musicians oh, that, conducted? That, that, that's 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 uh, 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 very later. Um, that must have been in the mid nineties. Um, I went to uh, in Denmark. We have got a, a music camp for amateur players, um, which is every summer um, a big big event with um, uh, about four hundred uh, amateur players. Uh, you know, making. Various groups uh, of, of orchestras, 
and uh, it all happens within the week. So there's 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 a there's a schedule for for each day with rehearsals. Um, but in between, you can actually form your own orchestra uh, as a sight reading orchestra. You know, you can collect an orchestra together to play a symphony for two hours, or you can also play a lot of chamber music. And um, one one of the years, and I think that must have been about the mid nineties, I collected an orchestra to conduct uh, the Egmont Overture by Beethoven. So that was that was that was the very first time I stood in front of an orchestra as conductor. And I, I mean, um, can you remember how you felt? Because one of the things about being a conductor, well, this is again in my fantasy, is that wonderful feeling that you bring down your back on, and this wonderful sound envelops the concert hall. I mean, it's it. I, I'm almost tempted to say it's a kind of power trip, really. Did you feel that, or were you just so nervous you didn't feel anything very much? <laughs> well, I, I, I definitely was nervous. I can tell you that. But but at the same time, I must say, you know, because I I I I was studying music already at that time. Yes. Um, started the violin and also playing the piano, and um, so I I I had a lot of experience already playing in orchestra as a, as 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 a fiddle player. Um, but the repertoire for a conductor is is the best. I mean, in, as 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 a fiddle player, I was a Pianist, you know, it's it's compared to a conductor, it's fairly limited. But yeah. as a conductor, you have got the best repertoire, yeah. and the feeling standing in front of an orchestra was actually amazing. Yeah, and it, you know, of course, it it it. I, I wouldn't use the word power, but 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 of course, it is it is something special when you are up there and 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 yeah people are trying to follow you whether <laughs> whether whether it's possible or not but um but i just remember that experience was was for me really um uh, the mark where that was definitely not an orchestra player i was going to end up yeah uh, you, you there was no turning back from that point well we're not going to hear an orchestra now we're going to hear a piece of piano music from from greek why have you chosen this well, if I had to take a recording with me on a desert island, I would definitely have to take something Scandinavian with me. And I think the piano music by, by Greek represents really the core of the essence of Scandinavian music. The lyric pieces by him are of such a great importance because if you if, if let's just take his piano concerto. And I think to understand his piano concerto even deeper, you have to know his, his lyric pieces quite well because, that, because the piano concerto is actually made of, of small, small pieces put together. And now you might think that the lyric pieces are just very technically easy, uh, small pieces, which you know everybody can play. You know, I've even, even I'm not a very good piano player, but but I I I actually managed to, to play some of them. Um, but they have got much more depth into them. And um, he wrote sixty six uh, in total. And there's a big uh, gap between the first one and the very last one. The very last ones they start to be a bit more you know mysterious, mm. a little bit more you know where you don't really know. Uh, where there is actually, if there is a tonality or not. Um, and the album, uh, the CD, the, the reference recording of the lyrical pieces is the one with Emil Giels, which we're going to hear that. Well, let, let, let's hear, uh, and it is in fact, uh, it's Arietta we're going to hear. Which is the very first one, yeah. Which is the first one, so, so let's hear that now. Yeah. one of Green's lyric pieces, and you've mentioned the piano concerto, and it's such a pity that that is the one thing that everyone knows by Green, because there's lots of other wonderful music by him, and it's a pity it's not played more. Um, that, that's a lovely choice, and thank you, for, thank you for choosing that. Now, can I just remind um, folk who are, who are listening to this, that at the end, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions, so I hope you're 
you know, ruminating about those questions now. Um, and as I say, all will be revealed at the end how you can ask those questions. Klaus, um, let me come back to this business of you deciding that you were going to be a conductor. Did you, how did you train to be a conductor? Because you can't, I mean, you can just do it, but these days you tend to get trained to be a conductor. How did that happen? When I, when I entered the music academy in Denmark, I had, a, I had a violin professor who sort of, um, who, who started to feel that, that the, the, the violin repertoire wasn't quite enough for me. Um, because um, I was, I, I, I had, of course, to play the basic standard, you know, violin repertoire. You, know, you have to play the bar, etc. Um, so I did that, but there were so many. I, I was, I was never fond of of of, of becoming a soloist in Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, and that was where my professor started to say, "Well, actually." And you also, you know, we had a lot of conversation about music in general. And that was after where my professor actually started to say, I think you should become a conductor. And um, my parents, as I said uh, early on, did not have any musical background. So it was a little bit difficult for them to, because if you have a child who is waving, uh, who, who's waving the arms all the time, you know, and, you know, <laughs> with, with the middle stick and everything uh, after recording, which, you know, I've done all that, uh, you know, what, what do you do with it? And, and, and if, if you feel, well, it's, it's, it's not going to vanish, it's not going to, to be less and less, it's going to be more, it, 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 it's, it's, it's going to be more and more. Um, so I think that was, that was actually, um, that was actually uh, 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 it was well spotted by 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 my professor in, in in Denmark at that time, and that was where I was then sent to a, um, a conductor in Denmark, uh, where I started to take lessons. Okay, we, we're going to hear now another piece of non-orchestral music, but this is vocal music, and again it, it's Beethoven, but with sung by tenor. I know you like very much indeed. Would you like to introduce this to us, please? Yes. Um, I love tenors. I, I, love, I, love the tenor, I love the tenor boys. Um, and again, if I had to be on a desert island without any contact to, any, to anybody, um, I would definitely need to have some tenor, uh, the boys of a tenor with me. And there would be no question that would have to be Fritz Wunderlich which I just think is maybe the biggest tenor, uh, which we have got died far too early and far too sad. Uh, but what an achievement, what a legacy he has left us, which tells everything. Um, well, I, I, I've got some records of him singing Schubert, but I don't think I've got him singing Beethoven. Now, what, no. What have you um, chosen this? The... The album um, contains the um, Schumann Dichterliebe, and I think that must be one of the best ever recorded um, a lead cycle by, 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 by Schumann. And um, so get, get to listen to that, because that's, I can only recommend it. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. But what, what, would you, would, uh, what you also would discover on that CD is that it contains some Beethoven and Schubert songs as well. And one of my favorite Beethoven songs is the Adelaide. And um, before I heard the Wunderlich version, I knew a couple of other tenors uh, mm -hmm. uh, on record uh, uh, who did record it. But I must say the Wunderlich is absolutely amazing. And on top of that, you have Hubert Giesen, who is an absolutely amazing uh, accompanist. It's like a, a German uh, uh, Gerald Moore. Um, and the way, not just that the uh, the lead, the Adelaide by Beethoven starts, but the way that um, Wunderlich actually pronounces the word Adelaide. I've never heard anything like that. It's absolutely Let's amazing. Let's hear that now. Well, the unmistakable 
voice of Fritz Wunderlich there, and we're going to hear uh, uh, another tenor a little later on. So uh, we look forward to that. You have mentioned training to be a conductor, but I imagine some of the things that you have to do as a conductor has got nothing to do with what you can be trained for, because you're, you're, you're meet, if you go to an orchestra for the first time, you're meeting, what, sometimes 70, 80 people for the very first time, and you've got to be able to make them do what you want them to do. So meeting an orchestra for the first time must be pretty nerve wracking, must it? You've got to kind of establish yourself with them right from the off. Yeah, it's, um, it's usually the first 10 seconds, which are which are which which are most important. That's that's why you can you can tell uh, whether this is going to be a good week or not. Um, and actually, it, it's 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 very funny because as a, I I know that as an orchestra player, actually, the, when you see a conductor for the first time at ten o'clock on Monday morning, just the way he he, he walks to the rostrum, you can tell whether it's going to work or not. Um, at the, and as a conductor, you can also say time. Uh, you can also tell what you know how it's going to be for the rest of the week. Um, it's a funny thing. It's I, I I can't really describe exactly what it is, but there's something in the in the atmosphere, and and you know it's 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 you know also as a conductor the the, the personal presence. You know the the way the way yeah. you look, the way you speak, the way you, you know you walk. Um, but you know all these things. You know they actually happen before you make your first downbeat. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's yeah it's 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 a funny thing actually. But um, well, another great mysterious great thing, and, and I've spoken to uh, orchestral players about this often, that sometimes um, a performance somehow just takes off, and it's as if the orchestra is playing more than the sum of its parts, as it were. It just absolutely goes wonderfully. And I've spoken to some of the Bardi orchestra about this, but also some of the Philharmonia. And they, I can remember someone from the Philharmonia saying, I just don't know why that happens sometimes. It's something to do with the attentiveness of the audience, and it's something to do with the fact that we're all feeling on top form, and mm -hmm. it's something very much to do with the conductor. But what you can put, you can't put your finger on why it is that sometimes uh, a performance goes absolutely brilliantly, and other times it doesn't quite take off. No, it's a, it's, it's a, it's, 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 it's a funny thing because it's, it's, it's very difficult actually to, to, to put words um, um, to it. I remember um, when. Abado was a chief conductor. Claudia Abado was a chief conductor here in Berlin. Um, we have some friends playing in the the, the Berlin Philharmonic, and I, I, for for some years I, I really wanted to to see some of the rehearsals he was doing. Um, and the and the uh, the recommendation was always it was always what I got to hear: don't go to the rehearsals; they are dreadful. But come to the concert. That's that's. <laughs> That's where it all happens. And with Abado, it was actually very, um, very phenomenal, actually, because Bardo was not, Abado was not a, a great rehearser. Um, and he could have all these, you know, difficult pieces, difficult scores, like uh, the new Viennese school, the second Viennese school, Schoenberg, Berg, uh, Webern, um, which, you know, would usually take a lot of rehearsal time, did really hard, detailed rehearsals um, and he never did that but in performances this was just sound in, he would be the only conductor who could make this so transparent and don't ask me how he managed to do it but it's unbelievable They're, these are mysteries these are deep waters Abs and I, don't, yeah. I honestly yeah. don't think we ever will get to the bottom of this but um we, we're going to have a bit of opera now um, something completely different from what we've heard before. This is Alban Berg talking of the, the, the Second Viennese School, mm. and it's from his opera Votzek. Now, why have you chosen this? 
Well, when I first time heard Botzek was back uh, in the late 80s. It was in 1988. And um, I was not very much into opera. Um, that was something that came uh, later on. I tried with Wagner at the time when Boulez did the, the Ring of Bayreuth, um, but I, I was not really, it was a bit too long for me. Um, <laughs> with Wozzeck, it was, a, it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was uh, it was different because it was much shorter. Because, you know, <laughs> Wozzeck is only about one, uh, one hour and 30 minutes, so it's even shorter than third act of Meistersinger by Wagner. Um, but I think Wozzeck has got everything. Um, it's, it's, it's very dramatic. It has a fantastic story and the music is absolutely, um, it's, 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 it's a, the music is a natural development from Wagner over Puccini, from Debussy over Richard Strauss. Um, and um, I don't know. I hope there's a little bit of time. Uh, there's, I, 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 there's actually a, 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 a funny story behind um, um, when I saw the Botzig the first time. In 1988, the Vienna Sta State Opera um, did set up a production of, of Botzig with uh, the Vienna Philharmonic and, and Abado, uh, Claudia Abado as a conductor. And um, that production had a special uh, attention in Denmark because uh, one of the uh, roles was uh, was sung by a Danish bass singer. The, the role of the doctor was sung by a Danish bass singer called Ove Haugland. So um, the performances uh, of Botte were shown live on Danish television, and that must have been about August September 1988. And I remember it was um, it was a sunny. Sunday afternoon and I was home alone and I did put myself in front of the telly and I watched it and I watched it without losing any concentration. Um, I didn't start to do anything else or, you know, I was just focused on that performance the entire time. And after that, I decided I wanted this recording as a Christmas present. And I said that to my parents and um, they gave me on Christmas Eve on the 24th in Denmark, we get our presses on the 24th in the evening. Um, my parents bought the recording of Wozzeck. And I remember when I had finished opening all my presents, I just went into my room. My parents did follow me because they didn't know Botzik. They had never heard about it before, so they were very curious to what you know. What would it sound like? What I uh, so burningly would have wished. Um, so they came with me into my room, and I put then on the record and heard the beginning of Botzik. And my parents, they left my room very discreet, very quiet. I think they were slightly worried. I'm sure that no one is going to leave us this evening. <laughs> uh, but let's let's hear. This is the opening of What's It by by Beg. Well, that was the opening of Alban Berg's great opera, Wozzeck, conducted by Claudio Abbado. And time is slipping past, and I think we want to move on to our next piece of music now. Uh, and again, it, well, this is a piece of music that I know you discovered quite by accident, and it is El Gal Symphony Number no. 2. Now, tell us the story of how you first heard that, Klaus. In 1986, um, I went for the very first time to England, and we, uh, I was singing in a boy choir in Denmark, and we went on a tour in the summer, um, 1986, a uh, three-week tour. And we um, started uh, with four days in London, and then we moved uh, further north. Uh, we went to Weatherby, Leeds, Hull, York, 
Um, and then Lincoln was the final stop where we sang in the, um, in, in the cathedral, the Lincoln Minster. And during the tour, I wanted to buy some English music. I, I knew already at that time Elgar Pump and Circumstance. I've got I already got a recording um, at, uh, at home, so I wanted to buy something different or something you know some English music. And I th um, I've got the the, cast the 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 recording here uh, next to me. And actually, I've, I've I've I have written in the recording when I actually bought it. Because we had the, on the 5th of July in Lincoln, uh, 1986, in the morning, we had the, we had, we had, we had the morning off. So uh, I went for some shopping and I went to the local Woolworth in Lincoln where they had some <laughs> tapes, music cassettes with classical music. Not a big selection, but a very small, but a very good selection. And then I remember I did find this, um, Trying to show it here, if you can <laughs> see it, maybe the light is a little bit. Yeah, okay. Um, but I, I did find, uh, I did find that uh, uh, a tape with the Elgar Second Symphony. As I said, I knew the name Elgar, but I didn't know that he would write in the symphonies. Um, so I didn't know the name Elgar. Um, the recording is with the Halle Orchestra and John Barbaroli. Uh, I had never heard about the Halle Orchestra at that time. I had never heard about John uh, Barbaroli. I even didn't know how to pronounce his surname. Um, so I bought that without, you know, actually knowing what it was going to be like. Then I remember when we then came back to Denmark, we came back home. Uh, the next day, I put the cassette on the tape recorder. And I was completely amazed about the opening of that symphony, not just the way it's written, but also the way it's played. You know? Well, let's just hear that then, the opening of the second oh. symphony by Elgar. And this, as you say, is by the great John Barbaroli with his Halle Orchestra. That is a that is a, a wonderful piece of music, and Klaus. Uh, of course, in England we think of this as English music because Elgar was an Englishman, uh, mm. and he looked even he, I mean, he looked like a retired colonel or something. Though he wasn't, but um, these days Elgar is played by Heitink and Barenboim and Scholte, these great European conductors. And Barenboim says. Elgar is not English music. It should be considered as proper mainstream European music. Now, as a, as a Dane, do you think of Elgar, do you think of that as English music or what do you, how do you feel about it? Oh yeah, because I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a little like the, the Greek. I mean, if, if, you know, you can feel the Scandinavian touch in it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a way it's written, the way it's put together, the way, you know, and it's the same thing with 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 the Elgar, and uh, you know, again, uh, 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 suggest me a symphony which has got the same sort of opening. I mean, it's it's uh, you know, it's I I kind of um, I cannot think about any symphony which has got the same you know, and 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 then what is special about this recording is you can really feel that is you know the relation between the conductor at the orchestra, it's like one unity. It's just, you know, two parts which are just so melt together. Um, so that's what, that's the reason when when I say about this recording, about the opening, it's not just the way it's written, but it's also the way it's played. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It is an absolute, it's a wonderful, wonderful recording that. Mm -hmm. And I suppose really Elgar was in, the Halle's bones, really, wasn't wasn't he? They, they knew how to do it. Um, we're, we're sort of cutting out quite a lot of your career, I'm afraid, Charles. But can I ask you how you came to be involved with the with the Bardi Symphony Orchestra? Um, well, I've been with the Bardi for a very long time, actually, because the first time I came over to uh, to work with the orchestra was back in 2005 in March. Um, 
And the reason behind it was um, 2004, I was uh, one of the finalists in the uh, Donatello Flick con uh, conducting competition in, uh, in London with the uh, London Symphony Orchestra. And um, funny enough, uh, I was actually not, uh, you know, I, I didn't get the first prize, I became number two. Uh, but but the one who was number who got the first prize was actually uh, uh, did actually receive the, uh, an invitation to come and work with the party, and um, but for whatever reasons couldn't do it. He didn't have the time for it or, or, or whatever. So um, strangely enough, the LSO rang me up and said uh, if I would be interested to go to the body and they uh, I remember the program was Crown Imperial by Walton with Brooke uh, violin concerto with our own Adam Summerhays as a soloist and uh, then the Shirazad by Rimsky Korsakov and as a conductor when you see a, pro a program like that you know it's very difficult <laughs> to say no um, so and on top of that I, 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 I did make a little bit of research you know to find out you know what what you know? What is you know? What is the Barney Symphony Orchestra? Because I had ne never heard about it, even that I had been living in in in, in England for for four years. Um, so um, and the people I spoke to, and when I mentioned the the, the Barney Symphony Orchestra, said, "Oh, go for it." So um, and the rest is history, as I say. And you've been, I can't believe it's 15 years we've been doing pre concert talks together. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you know, you, uh, you know me better than my wife, actually. <laughs> well, I hope not. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> we, we've, we've come on to the penultimate piece of music now, and a reminder to everyone who's watching and listening there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. So do think of some, please. And I, as promised, we've got another tenor. Um, just Explain who this is and why you've chosen this music, please, Val. Um, one of the biggest tenors we had in Denmark um, is called Axel Schutz. And he um, has become a, a bit of a national symbol in, in, in Denmark um, due to the Second World War. Um, when the Germans occupied Denmark, um, a lot of Danish arts uh, music uh, was not allowed to be performed. Um, so what they did instead of was that they collected a lot of people together to sing along. Um, that would be inside, but also outside. And Axel Schutz was one who would lead a lot of these um, events. So they would, you know, sing all these, you know, very popular uh, Danish uh, songs, which we all would know very well. Um, and um, one one of the most famous songs that he would sing would be the one we are going to hear now. Um, do you remember this autumn? Um, and so this is basically a popular, a piece of popular song of, that would be incredibly well known in Denmark. Then. Yeah, I mean that. I mean that. That's you know. Also, Carl Nielsen wrote uh, uh, a lot of songs, which you know you would sing uh, at school, yeah. and you would ask, could ask every person on the street, you know, about, uh, you know, and 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 they would know they they, they would be uh, able to sing it. Um, and this, even it's not uh, uh, Carl Nielsen who has written this song, but another uh, Danish national romantic called Peter Heise. Um, but Axel Schutz is is really the, the voice of of my childhood because it's uh, uh, it's 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 just it's 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 a song you just uh, it's 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 a type of voice or a, a voice that you can't avoid. Well, let, let's let's waft you back to your childhood, Klaus, and listen to this song. Do you remember this altar? Listening to that, um, you clearly like that kind of light 
very expressive tenor voice because I mean Wunderlich and, and what we just heard are rather different but they've both got that wonderful clarity and lightness of voice yes I mean I think it's um especially as a as 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 a player maybe as a fiddle uh, as a fiddle player but 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 in general if you play an instrument i think the singer's as a singer's voice is really essential to understand as an instrumentalist to understand the way of phrasing um so i think it's 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 um i i remember i, I used to have um, another uh, uh, violin professor who would always um, refer to as a, 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 a rather well-known German tenor called Josef Traxl, and there he would uh, there's a recording uh, of him singing the, uh, the 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 famous tenor aria in the Rosenkavalier by Strauss, and that was always that was you know the voice of of Traxl was always used as a model for a string player how you know to phrase and how to play a proper legato. So I think, you know, that is, is, is um, I, you know, I don't sing myself. I don't, you know, I'm not a singer by myself, but I, I've, 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 I have learned a lot from singers and also listening to singers. Well, thank you for introducing us. I'm sure, well, I'm, I certainly have never heard that before. And I'm sure most people listening will not have done that. I think that's absolutely beautiful. Now, very sadly, we're, we're coming to our last piece of music now, though I, I keep saying there will be an opportunity for folk to ask questions, and we hope that you will do. But I suppose we can't really not have a choice of music and not have Mozart, and you've chosen Mozart's piano concerto number 27. Why briefly have you chosen this? Well, I could not imagine being on a desert island without having Mozart, that would definitely have... Not that this programme is anything to do with Desert Island, do you understand? No, I, but I think it was... I think For it, copyright reasons. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, I mean, it's, you know, Mozart would, you know, I, I, I wouldn't like to be without him. If I, you know, have to select, you know, eight recordings, you know, it definitely had to be Mozart um, uh, among them. Um, the piano concerti by Mozart are um, maybe the most musical complete of all uh, the types of works that, that Mozart ever wrote, you know, opera, symphonies, uh, and et cetera, chamber music. Um, I went to Boston uh, about 20 years ago and I met the, the principal flautist at that time called Doria Dwyer. And I remember she said to me, um, if you really have to learn Mozart at the best, listen to his piano concerti. And I was very amazed by that advice because as a flautist, um, I know very well that, you know, that they're not that the, the, the flute parts in the Mozart piano concerto are not that very interesting. Um, and, uh, the, and there are a lot of them where there's no flute at all because Mozart didn't like the flute actually. Um, but um, so so the more you know when I when I heard an advice like this from a flautist, you know I got really keen on getting into the piano concerti. So the moral here is that piano concerti by Mozart are not just interesting for the pianist; they are also interesting for the rest of us. Well, let's hear then uh, part of Mozart's piano concerto number twenty-seven. That was uh, part of Mozart's piano concerto number 27. Sarah Haskell uh, playing the piano, the Bavarian State Orchestra of French Fritschai was conducting it. And that's your last choice, Faust, but we're not going to let you escape yet because what we're going to ask you to do is join, uh, is answer some questions from the folk who are watching and listening. Um, if you do have a question, click the raise hand button which you can find at the bottom of your screen, as shown on the slide. That's what a yellow hand looks like, in case you don't know. Um, I will then ask you to unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, but we'll just give you a minute or two to formulate your questions and indeed find the raise hand button. Very important that. In the meantime, let me just ask you one more question 
before we get things started in the question and answer session, Klaus. And I mean, I've purposely left this to the end because, well, you've mentioned it as we've gone along that we are all in lockdown now. You can't do all the things that you busily do during a normal year. So how have you been spending your time in lockdown? Well, I've basically done nothing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, it's, no, I mean, yeah, it's it's true. You know, that's that that you know, there's nothing going on at the moment. And um, probably the next time I will be, you know, the last time I my last concert was in November, and I think the next time I will be on stage again will be in September. But um, who knows? So what have I been doing? Well, you know, I I've. Well, I must say I really miss working um, because a conductor without an orchestra is basically nothing. Um, when this is said, I have also explored that a lockdown also has got some positive, uh, uh, you know, positiveness. Because um, I must say for the first time ever, I never had any pressure. Um, you don't have to, you know, piles of scores that you have to learn um, and that allowed me you know time you know to do a lot of reading which I never really had the time for um, also listening to a lot of music you know um, coming back to the subject you know about the uh, recordings um, I have got you know I'm not a streaming person I'm a very old-fashioned person what listening to music uh, uh, in, in matter of listening to music, because you know, I still have got my LP collection, and I still listening. I'm still listening to my LPs, and of course CDs as well. Um, so I'm enjoying actually that I have got more time um, for that. And, you, and then you know, also you know, I've got time you know to uh, spend more time with the family, um, going for walks, and you know, all this you know, it's not it's not uh, it's not a waste of time, you know, because it all goes back into the music making. So you will come back finally when we resume ordinary life, such as it is. You will come back hopefully refreshed. Absolutely, you know you will have. Uh, I, and I, I think actually, you know, by you know calming down, because I, I, as a person, I don't think I had ever uh, felt so calm inside. So I think you know a lot of my speech will actually be a, a, a bit slower, which I'm sure that a lot of the body players will welcome. Can I just ask you, and this is a sort of rather an odd question, I suppose, but it, it has occurred to me. Have you ever been asked to conduct a piece of music which you simply said, no, I can't stick that music? I mean, I know you said that you don't like doing Wagner because it's too long. Um, but what, are, there, are there any pieces of music which you just think to yourself, this just isn't me? Well, I have to say the... Body committee really twisted my arms when we did the gig uh, gigs in the garden at the Montfort Hall because uh, I was asked to do the Pink Panther, and if, <laughs> if there is a piece I simply cannot stand, is the Pink Panther. Um, but here we are. It was uh, in 2019, and two years later, I'm still here. My, I'm, I'm still alive. But on the whole, you're like someone who's a taxi driver, and if someone gets in the car, you have to drive it then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and is there a piece of music which you have always, you know, really had ambitions to conduct, you really wanted to conduct, but you just haven't had the opportunity yet? Well, I think, I think if... If, if there would be a piece, I, I think Wozzeck would definitely be high on the list because um, it's, 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 it's a challenge for everybody to do. Um, I think when, the, when Wozzeck was performed the first time, the orchestra alone had 40 rehearsals. And um, today it's only, it, it, it's only the, the, the big opera houses who can, uh, who can tackle um, a, 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 a piece of that stature um, and even you know if you go to the big opera houses they just don't put Botzig on and can play they will have 
to rehearse it very carefully. It just shows how difficult it is. So I think if, you know, that, that would definitely be a piece I would love to do. I have to say that the people have been struck dumb so far by this evening's conversation. And yes, we can hear you. Okay. No one seems to want to talk to us, though. Gentlemen, this has been a wonderful evening. Absolutely fantastic to hear you both and, and going through it. Um, I presume you're trying to do some yellow hands, or if you're not, you are being very quiet. I've asked my brother to ask a question as well. Klaus, I've always wanted to ask you this question. What do you think of Leicester? You clearly did not know where Leicester was on the planet, I presume, when you were asked by the Bardi Orchestra. What do you think of Leicester now? <laughs> oh, 15 I, years I, later. Not... Sorry? 15 years later. 15 years. Oh, you know, I've, I've, well, I think actually the moment to ask the question is very good because, you know, now I haven't been in Leicester for so long time. I have to say, I miss it. I really miss it. It's, it has become my second home. So have we got another question then, dear boy? Hello, John. It's David here. Oh, Come David, in, a though. question from you. Gosh. And from one conductor to another, Klaus, I have your baton in my music room. It's rather different to my baton, and I know you don't like using my rather heavier weight ones. What's, what's it about a light baton with you? Why do you prefer that to a heavier weight one? Um, <clears throat> well, I've... I, um... I don't know if, if I actually have got any preferences because um, I remember when I started conducting at the Royal College of Music, we were all forced to, um, to use different uh, patterns, you know, different lengths, different weight, um, and also, you know, with, 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 the, um, with the different, uh, uh, you know, handle. Um, so, you know, um, and I think that was actually very great to, um, so if, if if you give me if you give me a stick, you know it doesn't really matter. I don't have any. Um, so, um, but I must say I, I remember your baton as being very good. I've, um, I've, and if you would give it to me, I, I, I would I would use it without any um, you know without any hesitation. Uh, we've, <laughs> we've got we've got questions flooding in now. I'm going to ask Jane to ask a question. Hello, Jane. Hello, John. Thank you. Klaus, good evening. Yeah, um, good. It's a real pleasure to be working with you. I am absolutely loving it. I joined the, the Bardi, what, three, four years ago, and I've been so impressed by Klaus and loving working with you. Well, Klaus, thank you so much. That's so kind of you. Just tell us, what makes a British, or, uh, a British orchestra different from a German or a Danish orchestra, and how do you have to adapt to be able to work with us? Well, I remember when I came to England uh, as a student, I was uh, so amazed by um, the, sp the speed of learning, um, the sight reading, the level of sight reading is just uh, second to none. Um, and that's where, what, where I usually would have three or four days in Germany, you know, I have three hours in uh, in um, in England. Um, no, it's 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 a discipline. It's the skill of really, you know, changing things extremely quickly, which I think is it's 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 so great to see because you just don't see it anywhere else apart maybe from uh, from the states. So um, so it's therefore I really love to come. To work with the body because even if you can say that yes the bodies would be not an, a real professional orchestra but it still has got the same qualities and, and, and this still the same approach in um, in um, in performing in rehearsing which so you know it's 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 absolute a, an approach which suits me very well Jane, thank you very much indeed for that, and thank you for those comments about the orchestra, Klaus. Um, Colin Blackler joins us now. Hello, Colin. Hello, John, and hello, Klaus. Lovely oh, to hello, see you and to hear you. Good to hear you. And I've got Rose, Rose is here with me as well, Klaus. Ah, send my love to her. <laughs> Hi, Klaus. Ah, hello, Rose. How are you? 
Good, thank you. Excellent. Anyway, Klaus, my, my question is, of the, uh, of the things that you've done with the Bardi in your 15 years, is there any one performance that you particularly um, remember fondly or with any particular pride? Oh, that's a question. Um, well, the problem is if, if I mention one, I have to actually to mention all of them. Um, <laughs> I, I remember one of the very early concerts I did with the Bardi where we did the Verdi Requiem with the Bardi Symphony Chorus. Um, and I remember Eric Chapman was leading and in the big final cl climax in the Liberame towards the end of, 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 of the Verdi Requiem, um, I just remember everybody just went for it. And, um, and uh, um, I didn't actually feel it in the, in, in the moment where it happened, but I, um, I, uh, when I got the, the recording, um, I listened to it and I couldn't believe what I heard. And I remember after the performance, Eric, he came to me uh, when we walked out together and Eric, he said, you know, what the hell did you do to them there? Um, um, and I remember when when we were when I was listening to the recording here at home, my my uh, Julianne, my wife, uh, uh, couldn't believe that it was done by a local amateur orchestra in England, because and 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 and, and with, a, with, a, with with a, with an amateur chorus, because it was just absolutely amazing. Try to listen to it, it's just you know towards the end of the Liberame, the Verdi Requiem, and you will just hear you know this is just. You, you know, you will get everything blown off. Colin, th thank you so much for that question. And thank you for that answer, Klaus. Richard Meads wants to ask a question now. Good evening to you, Richard. Good evening, John. Good evening, Klaus. Good evening, Richard. How lovely to hear from you. How are you? It's very good to hear you. Can you hear me OK? I can hear you well. Fantastic. I'm very much looking forward to coming back and performing with you. Well, it's going to be so great to have you back, Richard. <laughs> um, my question, as a, obviously as a, a, a musician, we have very, we have different challenging pieces, like for example, the Rite of Spring, etc. Um, as a conductor, what's the most challenging piece that you've conducted to date, and why? I think. I think um, one of the pieces I've been looked, uh, one of the pieces I've looked at um, uh, during the lockdown has been the um, uh, variations by uh, by Arnold Schoenberg, uh, Opus Thirty One, for full orchestra. I think I, I've I must I have never conducted that piece, but I think that is from uh, uh, I think that is the most challenging score I ever have seen so far and i must actually say i you know how much i love that piece i don't know if i would dare to perform it because <laughs> it's so difficult because you know it's changing meters all the time nothing is on the beat and the tempi are just changing as well wow thank you very so, much um i think i think that's probably the best answer i i i, I can give you thank you Thank, thank you very much indeed, Richard, and, and thank you, Klaus, for that. Um, I don't think we've got any more, have we? We think that that is it. So it remains for me to thank you so much in, in Berlin, Klaus, for taking well, time out to be involved in, in this. But what we felt will be the first of a number of, of, uh, of these occasions, and it's been great talking to you. And I said we've talked to each other for 15 years, but actually, we, we, we haven't talked about the kind of thing we talked about this evening. I, mean, I found it absolutely fascinating, and thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you, John. I, I think, you know, the entire event has just been so great. I and, mean, you know, um, we haven't seen each other for so long. And, you know, it's 
it's of course not the real thing, but it's absolutely better than nothing. And I'm absolutely going to be in the audience uh, when the next uh, uh, interview is going to take um, uh, to take place. Well, thank you very much indeed, Klaus. And there are lots of other people uh, whom we must thank for making this occasion actually work. Um, mm. The technical presentation uh, was by Alan Hames. Thank you, Alan. And thank you, David and Robert Kalo as well. And thank you for all the wonderful slides and the amount of time and effort which has gone into making this occasion look so very professional. Thank you very much indeed. You. Um, I should also say that um, you will be able to find out, watch this programme again and others in the series uh, via the Bardi website, which is www.bardi.org.uk. And our next, our next occasion, our next question and answer session, our next interview session will be with Adam Summerhays. So do look out for details of that. Well, that's it for this evening. I most thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you for being with us. Thank you to everyone who's made it possible. Thank you, everyone. And look forward to doing it again next month. Good night and cheerio. Good night, John. Thank you.